Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck, host of Welcome Home, where we love telling life-changing stories that offer us hope and inspire us in our walk with Jesus Christ. Well, when we produce Welcome Home, we're always on the lookout for new stories that we can make into a special program that simply spotlights someone's journey, that just tells the story. And today's life-changing story is simply that. We're going to take a glimpse into how God truly fashions His custom-made plan for each of our lives. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's life-changing story. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. We have such an important topic to be talking about. You know, a lot of times here on Good Life 45, we like to broach some subjects that are maybe controversial, maybe they're social issues, maybe there are things that are a little bit edgy and you might write in and you might ask, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about things when you should be just talking about Jesus? Believe me, everything that we talk about has a biblical perspective and goes back to what would Jesus do? How would Jesus respond? And I want to know that. I want to learn and I want to figure out how Jesus would respond, especially when there is racism in our culture today. And uh, Dr. Gabriel Salguero is here here with us to help us walk through something. He's from Puerto Rico and he's the pastor at Calvario City Church, Calvary City Church, Calvario City Church, both whatever are, it is, Gabriel. Great. I great. love it. Thank and you. I love your church and I love your leadership. But Gabriel is going to help us today to understand that, yes, unfortunately, there is racial tension among blacks and whites, uh, probably with Asians, but also we don't often think about Hispanics mm -hmm. and the fact that there might be racial tension among or uh, among white people and Hispanic people. Is that true? No, no, there's racial tension is a human problem. And wherever there is a mix of races, uh, there, there are misunderstandings and stereotypes mm -hmm. and sometimes sadly prejudice and oppression. Yeah. And so it's not a new topic. You started by saying uh, we talk about things about the Bible. But well, yeah. there were racial tensions in the Bible. Absolutely. Yeah. The, remember when the church started in Pentecost, mm -hmm. the, the Jews didn't know what to do with the Greeks. Yes. And the Greeks didn't know what to do with yes. the Gentiles. You're right. And so it's not a new problem. The church had to deal with it at yeah. the beginning when the Jewish church was becoming a multicultural church, mm -hmm. especially in Acts 5. Mm. When, and what did they do? They began to appoint multicultural deacons. Mm people who had a Jewish mm -hmm. genealogy, but Greek names. Mm -hmm. And then Paul, who was a Jew, yeah. he, he mentored a Greek Jew yeah. in Timothy and in Titus. And so this is, this yeah. is not new. Right. There are 54 million Latinos living in the United States. Yeah. 54 million. So one out of every six babies born yeah. is Hispanic. Right. And so we have to learn how to get along, to go along. Right. And part of the job of the church is to be a racial reconciler. Mm -hmm. But not just kind of some facile reconciliation, but one based in justice, mutuality, mm -hmm. dignity, and respect. And so if it's true that it's 54 million if you count Puerto Rico, yeah. or 50.4 sure. million if sure. outside of Puerto Rico, in the mainland, we, we need some work to do. And I think the church can lead the way. Uh, there are many Latino churches. The fastest growing segment of evangelicalism in America is mm -hmm. Hispanic. Mm -hmm. There are close to six and a half million, almost seven million Hispanic evangelicals, many of them yeah. in this great state of Florida, yes. of Florida. Absolutely. And so, and so we have some work to do. And regrettably, um, there's some attitudes learned. There's some mm -hmm. things in the air that the church can help overcome with the gospel of Jesus you know, Christ. Yeah, absolutely. You've said before, Gabriel, that New York City is sort of a mecca for being a melting pot. Yeah. All kinds of ethnicities, all kinds of people have gathered there throughout the years with the immigration, immigrants coming in. Well, Florida is, has become that. It's become like a second New York City is what you've said. That's right. And so is it easier or is it harder in a place where you have such diversity? It, it's always harder initially. When diversity is a new thing, uh, when there are greater numbers, yeah. we, we fear the unknown. And yeah. uh, we're afraid of somebody who may speak with a different accent, mm -hmm. might have a different look, a phenotype. They mm -hmm. might be darker or, mm -hmm. or lighter. And so how do we overcome fear? The gospel tells us that perfect love Cast overcomes fear. fear. Yes. Right? The opposite yes. of fear is not courage. Yeah. The opposite of fear is love. Mm -hmm. And instead of making judgments or saying, well, this person, my mother used to say, I, I speak with an accent, but I don't think with an accent. Mm, that's great. <laughs> you know, that's I, great. I have a college degree. I'm yeah. very reflective. I'm thoughtful. Yes. My parents are pastors yes. uh, for the last 40 years. And so they led a multicultural church. And, and you were part, brought up in New York City, right? I was. I'm a Jersey boy, Jersey okay. native. Yeah. And I've been here in Florida for two years. Mm -hmm. I pastored in Manhattan 
mm. the most diverse uh, city in the world, uh, and for 10 years, and one third of our church was Chinese, mm. one third of our church was Hispanic, and one third of our church was Anglo of every European, African American, English speaking. Yeah. And so we had a lot of work to do on racial reconciliation, sure. and we didn't sure. get it perfect, but we kept yeah. trying. Yeah. Racism is rooted in fear of the unknown. How, Gabriel, do I respond when somebody says to me, because this is my heart, it really mm -hmm. is, I love to do programs like this, but what happens when somebody writes into me and they say, you're placing a lot of emphasis, you're almost exacerbating the problem when you talk about racism when we don't believe that it exists. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I've had many, many letters from Christ followers, yeah. I'm assuming that most people who, who watch Good Life 45 love the Lord they and do. are Christians, but they're telling me that racism does not exist. Look, <laughs> I, I tell people, perhaps you haven't experienced it personally, and mm -hmm. I respect that opinion, but talk to people who have experienced racism. Mm -hmm. Look. Have you? I, I have. Okay. Think about, I'm a Latino, uh, I'm Puerto Rican, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm an evangelical, I pastor an Assemblies of God church. But when I'm in a store, I, I can get followed around. Really? Uh, when I was uh, really? uh, working at Princeton, at, I worked at Princeton Theological Seminary, I was pulled over and somebody asked me, why are you in this neighborhood? I said, well, I'm an assistant dean here, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so perhaps you haven't experienced it, and when mm -hmm. you haven't experienced it, it's not that in your face, mm -hmm. you, it's not your story, but that doesn't mean that's the story. Right. And so what I tell people is meet with people from all different colors and races and ask them, what, yeah. what's your story? Yeah. You know, what's, what, you know, that famous singer, you say, what's going on? Yeah, what's going, what's going on? What's going on? And so ask people about their stories. It's like saying, uh, you know, women experience sexism in many ways, that I, I'm, I'm a male, I'm yeah, not, I don't, don't know that, that story. I don't, right. and so I have to have the capacity. If you want to mm -hmm. overcome racism and mm -hmm. xenophobia, you have to have the capacity to listen to other person's stories who mm -hmm. may be radically different from you. One of the greatest commandments in scripture is hear, O Israel, or listen. Mm -hmm. And so I get it. You don't see it, perhaps you haven't experienced it, or perhaps it's not part of your history. But there are other people who from day to day, I mean, look at the news, look at Charlottesville. That, this was a yeah. very tragic moment. And right. to the credit of the church, the church was front and center trying to build bridges across race. And so if we ignore yeah. it, that doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. So we have to uh, provide a grace-filled Yes. and gospel-informed response. Right, and when we have that platform here and we want to be able to do that. Mm. Gabriel Salguero is a little boy living in New Jersey. Were there times, and I, I know you've just told me a couple of examples of people following you around, but as a little boy, did you ever know that you were different from other people or, or was there any racism against you as a little boy? Sure, yeah? I mean, one of the cases was in kindergarten. I was discriminated against by my kindergarten teacher to the degree that my I was complaining, my mom, she didn't like to make a fuss. My mom was like, man, he's new to school, he's getting adapted. But my mm -hmm. next door neighbor, who's a Seventh-day Adventist woman, told my mom she experienced when I was mm -hmm. shoved by my kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I fell down the stairs. Wow. And there was, it was a, it was, it was a tough moment for- Because you were Latino. Yes, I was, because at that time, I was one of the few Latinos in you this, in this, it was in the sub suburbs, yeah. it wasn't very diverse. Yeah. And I, I, you know, to unpack that story as, as a five-year-old in kindergarten is very hard. My mom came to the school and spoke to the teacher mm -hmm. and, and, wor and worked with the school system, say, hey, look, we're different, but we're the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all created in the image of God. Yeah. And so to, to say that racism does not exist is to ignore the stories of millions of your brothers and sisters right. in Christ. Right. And so let's listen to their stories, yeah. not for guilt. Guilt doesn't help anybody. Not for shame. Shame doesn't help. But so that there's an empathy, mm -hmm. there's, there's a compassion. Mm -hmm. When you hear somebody's story and you walk in their shoes, you have compassion. And the gospel calls us to that. And after you hear the story, here's the question you should ask. How can I help? Yeah. What right. can I do to be in solidarity, in, mm -hmm. in Christ-like solidarity with you? And it takes relationship to do that, yes. Gabriel. I've got to get to know you. Yeah. I've got to know what you're like. Yeah. I've got to have a, uh, an African-American best friend yeah. who, who I, it, that I can really understand what her daily grind yeah. is like. Let's go one step past the person who does not acknowledge racism and go to the next person. This is kind of just a little level above it. Yes, racism exists, but here's what this person says to me. This person will say, yeah, but just have them pull themselves up by their bootstraps and move on. Racism should be over with. That person's been suffering. They've been Latino. They've been black. They've been Asian, whatever it is. But yeah. they, can, they can persevere. They can move on to the next level. What's wrong with that argument? Well, I think that 
people mean well, but there's just a fundamental misunderstanding. You're so sweet to even say that. That's not my first response. No, you, you Thank know, you for that. Christ calls us to mm -hmm. a spirit of grace, but not grace without truth. Yeah. Grace has to be accompanied to truth. What's the truth about this? Mm -hmm. This this kind of Horatio Alger myth, mm. which is put yourself up by your bootstraps. It's right. called the Horatio Alger yes. myth. Is it ignores systemic injustices? Yes. That, that there's systems, not everybody can do that. Yeah. There, there are, there's just <laughs> so. For example, there was a, a book written called Savage Inequalities. What if you went to a school district that didn't have the same quality of education mm -hmm. as your friend in another county mm -hmm. that had a much more affluent, right? They're both trying hard, but they don't right. have the same resources, right. the same quality of education. So there's a, there's a disadvantage. Yeah. Equality, which God calls us to, and justice, right, is not everybody has the same outcome. That's not equality, mm -hmm. but that everybody has the same opportunity. Yeah. And when you love somebody as your sister and brother from a different race or a different culture, what you're advocating, what you're calling for is that people have equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. If there are systemic injustices, it's like if two people started a race, somebody fires a gun, but they hold one person back and mm -hmm. let the other person go 50 meters. Mm -hmm. And then you tell the second person, just pull yourself up, catch up. No, right. he, he or she started with a historical disadvantage. So justice, biblical justice, biblical love requires that you don't let the person who started 50 yards up front and tell the person 50 yards behind, you must catch up. That's not justice. Mm -hmm. That's not police. That's, wait, something is wrong here. I have to do something so that they both start on the same equal What plane. is that thing that we do to make sure they start at the same place? Well, we have to advocate that education is the same for every child in America, independent of their zip code. Mm -hmm. I lived in New Jersey. I assure you that there's a difference in education between Princeton, New Jersey, and Camden, New Jersey. Absolutely. And, well, and the teachers too, Yeah. right? And so uh, what is justice? Ensuring the same quality education for every child in America. Yeah. What is justice? Ensuring, that people don't know this, that these are facts, sociological facts, that if you are a girl, or an African American, you are less likely to be called on by a teacher mm. than your white counterpart. Mm -hmm. People don't do that with intention. Right. It's in the air. It's mm -hmm. you're socialized. That that's not a an opinion. That's mm -hmm. just a hard data fact of mm -hmm. over a thousand schools studied in America. And so what do we have to do is help people overcome that 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 blindness or myopia to that. That how could it be that a young girl gets called on? maybe 50 times less than her male counterpart or a young African-American or a young Latino. Right. Uh, and so we have to begin to train people on what are the systemic disadvantages, mm -hmm. not because it's a political agenda, not because it's a partisan agenda. It's a Jesus agenda. It's a Jesus, agenda. Jesus said he came to set the captives yeah. free mm -hmm. in his famous Nazareth opening sermon. And that's mm -hmm. what we should be committed to. So, Gabriel, there are many people who are godly like you. And I want to compare you to um, somebody like Bishop Wiggins and, and Tim Johnson. And those men, when I speak to them, and Deborah Wiggins, and there are plenty of women out sure. there as well. Those are just the examples examples off the top of my head. When I speak to them and I ask them, how do you feel toward white people? How do you feel as a Latino toward the white person? This, these godly men and that godly woman will tell me, we love you. We don't have hatred. And, and, and there are plenty of, of people on the other side who, who resent the black person, who resent the Latino. Why are you so much further along than a lot of Christ followers who are white? All I know is what the gospel calls me to. Bible says love everyone. Independent of race, independent of socioeconomic status, independent of political party, I am called as a Christian to love my neighbor as myself. My black neighbor, my Asian neighbor, my Hispanic neighbor, my male neighbor, my female neighbor, my Christian neighbor, my Muslim neighbor, my Jewish neighbor. <laughs> the Bible says love your neighbor, and it doesn't say which neighbor. Yeah. And because the gospel calls me that, first, and secondly, because I've been loved. Mm. Only people who have been loved can love forward because they know what it is to receive yeah. unmerited favor. Yeah. Now, let me be clear. Yeah. I've, I've experienced prejudice. I've experienced racism, you know? And one of the things that I tell people is if you've ever experienced it, you never want anyone else mm -hmm. to experience it. Mm -hmm. And so it should make you not more resentful, but more committed to overcoming the sin 
of racism because mm -hmm. it's sin to hate somebody. Yeah. So there's no bitterness in you. When you see me as a white woman having all of these advantages, and yes, I do because I'm white, not because I'm privileged economically or financially, mm -hmm. but because my skin color is white, I have had a lot of advantages in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I wasn't brought up with a silver spoon. My, mm -hmm. my father and my mother were very, very middle class, mm -hmm. and yet I had advantages mm -hmm. that other people did not have. How do you keep mm -hmm. from being bitter and resentful other than, I know you said Jesus, but, mm -hmm. but how, do you not resent me a little bit? I, do, I don't resent <laughs> you. You know, I, I've often read the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And one of his most powerful phrases that keeps, that keeps <laughs> me saying is, we have to overcome people's capacity, great capacity for evil, with our great capacity for good. Mm -hmm. Scripture says you don't pay yeah. evil for evil. Yeah. You pay good back for evil. And right. so the, if if... If Gandhi once said, if everyone goes eye for an eye, it makes the whole world blind. Mm -hmm. And so, no, <laughs> no, sisters and brothers. Mm -hmm. I'm not resentful. I understand that, that people have different experiences and they may not be aware of my suffering and, 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 or of their own privilege. You know, there's people say, well, I was poor and poor. Well, there's economic privilege, but yeah. there's also racial privilege. Yes. And there's, there's gender privilege. Yes. You yes, might, you might right. have more privilege because you're a man over a woman. That's true. Uh, just look at... Fortune yeah. 500 companies, look yes. at all, look, do the demographic study. Mm -hmm. a dis, even a dispassionate study mm -hmm. of race a dis, will show you that there are major privileges and there are major disadvantages that the church is called to overcome. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Gabriel, about your church, Calvario City yeah. Church. Um, it is mostly Hispanic, is that right? Well, yes, but it's it, obviously we have an English service, so we have Haitians. Okay. We have people from Africa, Nigeria. Oh, good. We, yeah, we, we have, have a, white people. We do have white people. <laughs> we, a lot of white people, because okay. one of our visions at Calvario City Church is why we call it Calvario City Church. The name is half Spanish, is half English. Yeah. Is to be called a gathering place for all God's people. Mm -hmm. I really believe in the multicultural church in America. Oh, I love that. I, I think that is an answer. But it's to, it's an anomaly. Yes, it doesn't happen yeah. often. Where I go to church, yeah. I can look out and see some black yeah. people, but it's probably, yeah. you know, 95% white. Yeah. And it's hard. It's yeah. hard because... And black churches are 95% yeah, yeah. black. And Latino churches are 90% black. Right. It's hard to do multicultural because everybody has to sacrifice. Yeah. It's not just your favorite yeah. worship style, give. your right. preaching style. Yes. So is I, that, does that make it okay then? No, I think that <laughs> God calls us not to where we're comfortable, okay. but to where we love beyond boundaries. Okay. And so I think only 17% of churches in America, evangelical churches in America, are multiracial and multicultural. Mm -hmm. What that means is not that you have a smattering of yeah. a certain group. Right. So let's say you were 95% right. Latino and 5% white. You're not multicultural. Mm -hmm. the, what means is at least, according to this uh, graphic, at least 25% of your church is other racial groups, whatever the dominant is. If it's African American, 25% other. If you're white, 25% mm -hmm. other. If, if you're Latino, and that's a very hard to do because it takes a certain um, flexibility. Mm -hmm. People people want to yeah. worship in their right. worship preference, right. in their worship music, in their tradition. And the church is really not about me being comfortable. Yeah. And how am I ever going to really know a black person or a Latino unless I spend some time with that person? I've got to go to that church from mm -hmm. time to time. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have to join that church even to yeah. keep myself from being so, so segregated. You have children, I right? Do. How many children? I have two boys, 12 and 8. Two boys, 12 and 8. Let me ask you this. And this just popped into my head. I probably shouldn't even be asking it, but it just popped in. So I have to think it's the Holy Spirit. Would you allow your boys to eventually um, date someone of another ethnicity? Yes. White, black, yes. Asian, his, yeah. Hispanic? Ask, ask, ask me a hard question. <laughs> You wouldn't have any problem at all. No. Okay, but here's the deal with that. And and I'm I'm excited to see, you know, I wish I were going to be living in 100 or 200 years because we'll all be all mixed up yeah. and it won't we won't even be yeah. having these conversations. But admit to me that there are many many challenges in marriage. And to add that cultural and that diverse um, intermarriage, interracial marriage, just adds another component of difficulty in in having a successful marriage. No. Well, my interest in, in raising children is not having them do things because they're easy. <laughs> I'm a father. I want them to do things because they're right. Okay, good. And l love doesn't know color. You don't love somebody because they're black or brown or mm -hmm. white. You love them because you love them. Mm -hmm. You know, love doesn't have a color if it's real love, right. a color boundary. So I'm not raising my children... Good. 
to be comfortable, yeah. I'm tra <laughs> raising them to be Christian. Well, I, I remember sitting in a sermon one time, and this is probably, oh, could have been 30 years ago. So yeah. we're talking about a different, yeah. different day and time. But it was a white preacher speaking to a white congregation, and he was saying, do not be unequally yoked, which that's scriptural. We know that's scriptural. Yeah. But he was thinking that it meant racially. Yeah. So see, Gabriel, I'm being taught that yeah. as a young person that that's yeah. wrong. Well, I think we live in a different day. Yeah. You know, Dr. King said back in the, in the 60s that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. But our kids, my kids, mm -hmm. go to a multiracial school mm -hmm. here in Orlando. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they go to public school, yeah. and they, there are Asian kids and Latino kids and African-American kids. But they're in a minority kids. as Hispanics. No? What's, Your kids? I don't know. I, it, no? I don't know. It's changing here in Orlando. That's but great. It, but I, That's great. Yeah, they probably are in a numerical minority. Yeah. But it's a very diverse school. That's nice. It's a very, I went to school in New Jersey. When I was little, it was not as diverse. But by middle school and high school, that was a very diverse. And so America hmm. is changing mm -hmm. in terms of its diversity. And I see many much more interracial couples and intercultural couples. Yeah. And so I think the church is the should be the least segregated place in the world. Yeah. Remember if we had this vision of heaven from the book of Revelation, oh, yeah. Yeah. John sees a great multitude. Yes. It's a great multitude. Right. But you know that he sees differences. You know people say, I don't see color. Well, yes you do. Mm. You don't you you may not be prejudiced, but everybody yeah. sees color. Absolutely. Unless, I mean I'm yeah, talking we do. Of course, Yeah, right. And so right. unless you're colorblind. Yeah, that's right. And that's right. Not. And 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 John says that in heaven he saw them from every tribe, nation, and tongue. This is mm -hmm. in the end. Mm -hmm. So even in the end, you're gonna notice differences. Yeah. Because God is not trying to get away from right. difference. Right. God creates every snowflake differently. God created different types <laughs> of bird. Even creation is diverse. Yeah. So in heaven. Mm -hmm. We're still going to be different. Mm -hmm. We're still going to be, you, you know, green eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes in heaven. It's mm -hmm. not like, oh, in heaven, everybody's going to have the same color eyes. There's, no, even in a, so, and that difference is not to be uh, feared. It's celebrated. to be celebrated. Yes, right. It's to be, so in heaven, diversity is still going to be there according to the God, yeah. to, to what John says in Revelation 7 and 9. Every yeah. time, every nation mm -hmm. and every tongue before the Lamb. My younger daughter, when uh, 20 years ago, when she was in the first grade, she was in a classroom where there were two white girls. She was one white girl, and there was another little girl that was a white girl. And everybody else in there was, a, 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 was of a different ethnicity oh. or race. And I just thought, wow, I, I, we've never been in the minority as a white person. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did celebrate it, and I celebrated it with her, and I tried to teach her that this is a great thing. This is unbelievable. And I know she didn't probably even know it, but I can remember having conversations with her about it, saying, all these people are the same. Yeah. You know, we just need to be able to, I don't know if I said celebrate diversity, because I probably didn't as a little first grader, but I was so, so happy that that happened to her at such a young age. You're, on, you're right on it, Barbara. Diversity doesn't depreciate us or yeah. diminish us. Diversity enriches us. It makes us better. It makes us better. And so, you know, some people say, why can't we all be the same? Oh, God, no. No. <laughs> oh, Lord, no. I oh, certainly I don't, don't want a bunch no, of me right Oh, Lord. <laughs> I, my wife could barely deal with one Gabriel. You know? Right. God is not in the business of homogenizing us. Right. Right. There's a difference. Between, people say, oh, that, that, that contributes to, to disunity. No. Mm -mm. Unity is not uniformity. Yeah. Good. I'm... I'm united to my wife. We're yes. one flesh, according right. to Scripture. But I'm not my wife. Yeah, that's right. She's Jeanette. I'm Gabriel. Right. She's a woman. I'm a man. And so when people think of unity, they often collapse uniformity. We all have to be mm -hmm. the same. We all have to think the same. No. Unity means, despite our differences, we love each other. We get along. We work for the common good. You know. And so the, sometimes the question you ask me that I tell <laughs> Christians is, hey, for Christians, perhaps the question is not, can you meet my brother in Christ? but can I be your brother-in-law? Mm. Can your sister marry right. somebody of my race? That's right. That's so. right. That's tough. All right, Gabriel, we have one minute left. Yeah. If you were to say something to our viewers today to encourage mm. them and to help them see the importance of having these conversations, not just here on Good Life 45, but also around the dinner table, what would you tell our people? Look, I, I would say the church needs to lead on racial reconciliation and justice. We cannot ignore it. Millennials across the country are having this conversation. Yeah, they and they are. want the church to lead. Ignoring racism will not make it go away. Let's talk about it from a gospel angle, and let's have all our sisters and brothers come into the conversation and speak to it from the gospel. 
Dr. Gabriel Salguero, Calvario City Church. Thank you so much for being you here with us blessing. today. You, you are, are a blessing. blessing. I love you. Thank love you. what you're doing Thanks. in our community. And we're so grateful to have had Dr. Gabriel Salguero come across our path today. Um, keep these conversations going at home and um, let's be reconciled. That's what God wants us to live as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we've got more coming up for you. So stay with us, viewers. you were touched by our life-changing story today. We always see God's hand at work mightily in these incredible faith stories, these stories of hope in Christ. You know, there are times when we don't understand what God is doing in our lives or the lives of those we know and love. But here's the encouragement today. God is sovereign. Isaiah 55, 8 clearly explains, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I can't tell you how many times I've had to bank on those words. Words from God reminding me that I don't have to understand everything, but I do have to grab hold of the truth that God's got this. In every situation, He is holding our hands and walking us through the good times and the bad, the dark days and the bright. Well, thanks so much for watching today's life-changing story, and we pray that you will continue to find comfort and hope in in Christ. God bless you.